Uh, we're gonna talk about sound, I guess, right? We got clips, <laughs> but I think what's best is to have a lot of questions to you guys, from me and from the audience, because I'm assuming people have seen the films, and if they haven't, we'll at least see two or three of the clips, but not half an hour, because I think talking, frankly, a, a dialogue is better. When you, when you make a film, when does sound become part of the equation? Is it as early as the script? And if it is as early as the script, how does your thinking, how, how, how do you organize narrative ideas around sound? I feel like you know the answer to that question since we've, since we've written together. But um, <laughs> when James and I would write, when we did the yards, what I remember is you would take a, you would take music and create mood, and we would sit there writing. He was like, he goes, wait, 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 let's put this thing, and he had this little, what was that thing that you had where you were able to make it loop, and it kind of echoed, and we like kind of created a mood as we were writing, and it'd be like you know some choral piece that was just looped and being, ah, da, da, and we'd be like putting us in this mood. But I do try to. Uh, think of sound from the beginning. We had a really interesting challenge on Cloverfield because, you know, Michael is a huge Godzilla movie fan. Loves those movies and, and loves those scores and, and we had wanted to work together for a long time and when we were gonna do that movie, he was like so excited, he goes, this is so great, I'm gonna do this, this score for this movie. And then we had to break it to him that there would be no score <coughs> because there couldn't be. It was supposed to be found footage and he was like, that's really great. Um, and then, I, I think the words were, I hate you. Yes, exactly. And then he wrote this amazing overture for the ending in which he got to exercise every Godzilla demon and do, did the score that would have been in the big $100 million version where you You saw don't understand. Thing. I get really, like, literally, if I walk by a room that is playing, like, an Ultraman episode or something, all I have to do is hear it, and I get these chills through me. Still, I feel like an eight-year-old kid that is scared out of his pants. I love those things. I grew up on them. You are going to be hearing, by the way, this music from Cloverfield, apparently, which as is, you leave. Which is a fantastic thing. <laughs> it's true. <laughs> it's the thing they Chased use to you get out. you out of the theater. There was many times in the film I was thinking, God, I wish Giacchino could score this because emotionally that's what it needs. It needs he wished it because you were tired and you wanted to go home. Right, exactly. <laughs> I was tired. <laughs> I needed some sleep. Somebody called Giacchino. But... It, w it was literally it came down to building some of these ambiences. They were tonal things. We'd actually put them in sam samplers and synth synthesizers and build chords and have them change from major to minor and try to be do our best to be little musicians and do some of the things that he might be doing otherwise. And I I'd like to think we were effective to a point, but it's not to say that sound design can completely replace music in a, in a picture. I think there's certain things sound design does very well. There's certain things music does very well. There's some things they both kind of can do. But there was, it was a tricky challenge, even though it was such a tremendous gift. It was such a great thing to say as a sound designer, wow, I'll never get this chance probably in my career again. I better not blow it, and wow, this is going to be hard. And what we had was really just an X on a screen, and you guys were doing sound <laughs> to a, a green to X, a green that, was X that was like going, ah, ah, and the actor, oh my God. And it was like, it literally looked like <laughs> the really? cheesiest thing you've ever seen in your life. And the thing about it is, is that I wanted, though, the sound of the, I wanted something guttural. And these guys had put together all this stuff that was great. There was this great, like, clicking and cracking and scratching and stuff that made you go like, ooh. But there wasn't something that was quite uh, guttural, like, sound enough. And I said, we need something like, ah, 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 like this kind of thing. And, and um, <laughs> so Will goes... Okay, well, you keep saying that. Let's just do it. And right. so it was three in the morning at some really, really rickety. We had, our <laughs> facilities were like, we literally were mixing all night in some room where the doorknob came out. We couldn't, like, like we were, it was low budget. And these guys uh, recorded me running around them going, ah, 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 and then he yeah. would. <laughs> <laughs> literally. So when you watch, if you ever go back, I don't, we have that clip. We probably won't see that one tonight. But when you, if you ever go back and see that scene in Cloverfield, whenever the parasites attack and you're, ah, 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 ah. <laughs> We don't have that clip. Well, we, we do don't, have the clip. We, don't we have, have the clip. We have the clip. We do. Throw have it on up that. there, baby. <laughs> Let's get that clip going. When we do the mix, um, I do. I like to sit right in between these guys, and we talk throughout. And so it's not just like, okay. I mean, they they'll go through sections, but then I'll be like, oh wait, wait, wait. Wasn't there more? You had that really cool. Like, I describe it from your point of view. You're like in pain until <laughs> it's okay. Right. You know, and you right. cannot <laughs> abide it if there's one thing wrong. You know, it's like, no, no, no. Which is great. <laughs> Which is great. 
I remember once I did. I, there was a there was a the, one of the first things I I I, I was directing was a, it was a TV thing where we were doing a show and, and I remember there was this thing where I wanted this camera operation to have a, happen a particular way and it it slid over and I wanted no operation and the operator being an operator thought oh it needs to be operated but I didn't want that I wanted to do this and then I was like oh I said no when you do that it ruins everything and he turned to me and goes really Matt does it ruin everything. <laughs> <laughs> And right. I realize <laughs> that there are times when you commute. It's uh, I'm I'm reacting in a visceral way, and I sometimes these guys are the greatest because apparently I do say right. things Ma like that. I mean it's great. It's great. You pa care passionately about every aspect of the film. I don't feel like you're riding herd over us when no, you're right, there right. in the mix. It's a very it's a very natural thing. It's it's, it's kind of relax. like just hanging out up here and, and talking. It's like having a conversation about making the movie while we're making the movie. Right. You can sum it up by saying, I think we're all just kind of doing what we would have done as kids, and we're going into the backyard <laughs> and making something awesome, right. you know, or that we think is awesome, something that excites us, and I think that's pretty much the best you can hope for. Next week, we do Billy Friedkin, who is the sound master. Yeah. The Exorcist, that's where it's at. So I don't know if you, any of you are coming to that. You can hear Billy talk about it. He's the man. The importance of independent cinema is just the idea of creativity. I mean, to me, being creative is being independent, you know, and uh, the more independent you are, the more creative you can be. And there's a lot of work you can get in town, for sure, but the independent work, to me, seems to be the most creative work. I remember as a kid, just running around the yard, doing all of these things, I never felt so free and creative as I did then, and I feel like independent cinema, as cash-strapped as it may be at times, you're actually probably making making something better than somebody who has $150 million. So, so don't be afraid of it. <laughs> to me, the most critical attribute that a filmmaker, a, a, an aspiring filmmaker, a starting filmmaker can have is tenacity. Tenacity and passion. That if there's, some, if there's a story you have to tell, and you decide that no matter what, no one's going to tell you that you're not going to tell it. I used to say, you know, when I was in film school, that if I got out and I couldn't write a script and sell it and get the movie made and, and do all those kind of things, that I would, in those days, it was 16 millimeter. I would have made that movie in 16 millimeter no matter what I had to do because it meant that that was something I needed to say. And if you approach things that way and you're tenacious, you keep knocking at that door, you'll get in because it's going to be your passion that, 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 that sort of gets you to that finish line of, of starting to do what you want to do. And I say, do it. Just go out there. If it, you, have to, you have to take a, a, a 5D, a Canon camera, and go make a movie, why not? Go make that movie and, and show people what you see.